I'm Lynn Steinbach, and I'm a professor of radiology and orthopedic surgery at UCSF. And I'd like to review briefly imaging of the elbow. I'm going to focus on the ligaments and the tendons. So let's go over some normal anatomy. Here we have a lateral radiograph of the elbow. And we can see that in the distal humerus, we have a 30 degree angle of the humerus with the distal portion, which includes the trochlea and the capitellum. The capitellum aligns with the radial head and the trochlea aligns with the ulna. Now, on the right side, you can see an MR of the same elbow, but it's not flexed. And we notice that here we have the ulnotrochlear articulation. And in the ulna, it's important to know that the coronoid process lies anteriorly and the olecranon is posterior. And we have fat pads that sit in the uh, coronoid and olecranon fossa, which we can see on the radiographs over here. And they usually hug the bones, so we don't see the posterior fat pad, but we see a little bit of the anterior fat pad. We also have our ulnar tuberosity on the ulna where the brachialis muscle attaches. Now, on our radiographs, we can see effusions if it's a good lateral radiograph, and we get that anterior sail sign when the fat pad gets raised by fluid underneath. And very frequently, we will see some fat behind the humerus uh, as that fat pad gets raised by the fluid. Now, if you see an effusion like this and there is trauma, you should really look for a fracture. If there's no trauma, it's probably synovitis and it could be bloody or it could be from some sort of arthropathy. Now, in this radiograph, I don't know if we see any fractures. Of course, we'll always look at the radial head and neck first in an adult and we'll look at the distal humerus in a child. Um, but the one thing that you don't see well is the coronary process. The radial head lies over it. We get special radial head views, but we often don't see the coronary process. So now let's look at this patient's MRI on the right, a proton density non-fat sat image. And uh, we see beautifully why the fat pads are raised by the fluid. And if we look carefully and we see this coronary process, we may be able to see this non-displaced fracture although it's easier to see on the MR with the fat suppression and more T2 weighting. So that's why this patient had an effusion. So fractures, that's a very nice thing that cross-sectional imaging can help us with for subtle fractures. And MR is really good if you keep doing radiographs and you can't see anything and it's a non-displaced fracture. CTs can be very good too, but occasionally they can actually miss the fractures if they're non-displaced. So here we have a coronary process fracture with the fluid uh, in the joint. Now on the frontal view of the elbow, we have the distal humerus, we have the capitellum laterally and the trochlea medially, and those articulate with the radial head and the coronoid process. And we have our medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle in the distal uh, humerus. When we think about this and we're looking at it, we want to look at the joint space. We want to look at the attachments of the tendons to the epicondyles, look for uh, enthesopathy like extra bone if it's somebody who's done a lot of um, uh, repetitive motion. And if we look at the corresponding MR, we can see coming off of the epicondyles on the lateral side, it would be the extensor tendons. And on the medial side, it would be the flexor. So if we look at both of these images, we can see where those tendons would attach. We can also think about ligaments being underneath the epicondyles on the radiograph, although most of the time you won't see too much on a radiograph. But uh, remember that they're right there. The lateral one will go over in a few minutes, uh, the lateral collateral ligament complex. And the medial collateral ligament complex is underneath the medial epicondyle. So these are important ligaments of the elbow. So let's look at the medial complex, the ligaments that lie under the medial epicondyle, the ulnar collateral ligament complex. It starts with the anterior bundle going from the medial epicondyle to the very medial aspect of the coronary process called the sublime tubercle. It's the most important of all the ligaments on the medial side. The other important one 
uh, is a posterior bundle, which is the floor of the cubital tunnel. And that goes from the medial epicondyle to the olecranon. The transverse bundle isn't that important. Here are some images of this ligament, the uh, anterior bundle, underneath the medial epicondyle. Sometimes vessels or fat are right there. And you can see it going to the very medial aspect of the coronary process called the sublime tubercle. It should have a pretty tight attachment right there. And that's important when you get partial tears that we'll talk about. So here's a nice T1 weighted and proton density fat sat image in the coronal plane of the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. Nice low signal, thin, no uh, fluid around it. Uh, so that one looks really good. The posterior bundle isn't as important, but we will see it underneath the ulnar nerve in the cubital tunnel. It's part of the capsule, so that is the other component. Now, when we go over to the lateral side, we have the radial collateral ligament complex, and anteriorly is the radial collateral ligament proper, going from the lateral epicondyle to the annular ligament. Behind it is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Now, that is still a lateral ligament, but it does attach to the supinator crest of the ulna, behind and uh, medial to the radial head on the ulna. So that's why the word ulnar is in there. We call it the luckal, and it is extremely important for stability of the elbow. We also have the annular ligament that surrounds the radial head uh, going from the radial notch of the ulna there, and we will talk about that in a minute. Here we have the uh, anterior bundle of the radial collateral ligament going to the annular ligament that mainly is a soft tissue attachment for this anterior bundle, and um, it also goes to the radial neck. And if we look at the MR, it's nice and low signal going from the lateral epicondyle to the annular ligament with its overlying extensor tendons above it. Uh, here we have the very important lateral ulnar collateral ligament going from the lateral epicondyle behind the radial head and neck to the supinator crest of the ulna. And you can often see it on a single view, although sometimes you have to scroll on your MR to really catch that. And what you're going to be looking for, if you think it might be torn, it's usually torn right at the lateral epicondyle. This is a beautiful example of a normal one. Now here's our annular ligament surrounding the radial head. It, prox it stabilizes the proximal radial ulnar joint and it's formed from the lateral collateral ligament capsule and supinator muscle. So it goes around the radial head uh, from the anterior and posterior margins of the radial notch, and it also attaches to the radial neck. So you can see this on many of the MRs, this ligament, uh, but sometimes if you don't see it, it's okay too, as long as you don't have obvious disruption, fluid getting out in the back or anything like that. Now, here's the extensor tendons that come off of the lateral epicondyle. They extend the wrist and supinate the forearm. And here's a little diagram. We have a common extensor tendon that then fans out over the forearm dorsally. The extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is the deepest and most anterior one, the extensor digitorum communis, the extensor digiti minimi, and the extensor carpi ulnaris. Now, on the medial side, we have our common flexor tendon wad, and we have several muscles that are comprising that. The flexor carpial narus in the back, the flexor digitorum superficialis, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi radialis, and these flex the wrist and pronate the forearm. Also, for anatomy of the tendons, we have our distal biceps tendon, which attaches to the radial tuberosity. And coming off of the musculotendinous junction, the short medial head, is this structure that is sort of like a big uh, sheet that goes over the pronator teres and the flexor muscles, and it's called the bi lacertus fibrosis or biceps aponeurosis. It can be important in keeping your tears from retracting a lot, and we'll see some examples of tears of that structure in a bit. And so the biceps tendon flexes and supinates the elbow. And when you're doing MR, you always want to make sure that you catch the attachment of the biceps tendon on the radial tuberosity, which is below the radial neck. 
So here we see a sagittal image where we're catching the attachment and an axial image where we're catching that nice attachment to the radial tuberosity. Sometimes our biceps has two tendons attaching to the radial tuberosity, actually almost 70%. So you're going to see this all the time, the long head and the short head attaching to the radial tuberosity. And we'll see how important that is when we describe tears of the biceps tendon. Here you can see the short head being part of the medial portion, and it attaches below on the radial tuberosity, and we have our lacerative fibrosis coming off of that uh, area. And then the long head or is part of the lateral bundle, and it inserts proximal, and it's posterior to the medial bundle. Finally, the triceps. That has three uh, muscles, and we have our long head, which originates on the inferior glenoid at the top and attaches to the posterior lecranon as a nice low signal tendon <clears throat> on MRI. The lateral head uh, originates from the proximal humerus, and it also attaches to the posterior lecranon as a nice low signal structure. Now, I think a lot of people don't realize that the medial head, which comes off of the dorsal mid-humerus, and we see a little bit of it down here, is actually in front of the long and lateral heads, and it's attaching to the olecranon as a muscle, not as a tendon. So when you talk about tears, you want to mention what's torn. And a lot of people will call a complete tear of the uh, triceps tendon, complete width, but it's really not if the muscle's still intact, and you want to say what's torn. So if we look at a sagittal MR, T1 weighted, we see this muscular medial head attaching in front of the long and lateral head. And so those are the tendinous portions, and this is the muscle portion right here. Rupture of, bi of triceps tendon is rare, and we often see an avulsion fragment about 80% of the time, and I will show that to you. And occasionally the heads can sublux around the epicondyles and cause problems like snapping and ulnar neuropathy. Okay, so that was our uh, anatomy. Now let's go over a little bit about pathology that we can see on elbow MRI. We can see valgus stress effects on the elbow. We can also see posterior lateral rotary instability and uh, dislocated elbow, all the findings that we see on that as well as problems with those tendons that attach to the epicondyles, giving us epicondylosis and tears, and biceps and triceps tendinopathy. So let's look at valgus overload. This is a big reason people come in and have elbow pain. They don't have to be professional baseball players, but we do think about it with something like baseball. And here we have an example of a San Francisco giant pitching and in the late cocking and acceleration phase of pitching, we put so much stress on the elbow, which is already valgus, but is more in valgus, and opening up the medial side and compressing the lateral side uh, when we do this. So medial distraction actually will result in problems for that ulnar collateral ligament, the flexor pronator uh, tendons and muscles, the sublime tubercle that we talked about. You can get an anthesophyte or even a a fracture. You can also have the medial epicondylar avulsion in children who don't have their growth plate fused, and so that's called little leaguer elbow. And then ulnar neuropathy, because the ulnar nerve is right behind there. When you have lateral compression, you can get contusions of the capitellum and radial head or fractures. You can have osteochondral injuries of those structures and the trochlea, and also you get arthritis and bodies in the elbow joint. So let's look at some problems with valgus stress. One is the ulnar collateral ligament tearing, and it is the most commonly injured elbow ligament. Sometimes we'll do MR arthrography to see some subtle changes in the ulnar collateral ligament, especially this anterior bundle. And this is a T1 fat sat after an, ulnar, uh, after an MR arthrogram. And what it's showing us is that the anterior bundle is not attaching to the sublime tubercle where it should. It's going below it. And we're getting contrast, or if we don't have contrast, fluid going below that area. So they call that the T sign. 
And it is a partial tear that actually needs to be fixed in a, any kind of professional athlete and can take them out of their sport for a year and a half. And we need to make that diagnosis. We could also see subtle partial tears with signal inside the ligament um, without it being a T sign. Uh, but this uh, is something we definitely have to look for. Now, these two patients have different kinds of tears of that anterior bundle. One is proximal underneath the medial epicondyle, and we see all that high signal getting out right there into the surrounding soft tissues. And it is the most common location for an acute injury. Then we have one that's distal, and you can see right at the sublime tubercle that this anterior bundle is torn, and there's a lot of signal in the pronator muscle over that, which could be a strain or reactive fluid from the tear. Now, it's pretty rare, but we actually caught on axial images the tears of both the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament in its mid-portion right here with fluid getting out, as well as the posterior bundle underneath the ulnar nerve right here. You can see the wavy detachment uh, in that area. So that's a really significant tear. We remember that the anterior bundle attaches to the sublime tubercle. So sometimes with traction, it'll form this uh, enthesophyte going up the ligament. And uh, this is seen in 75% of baseball pitchers. Here's a radiograph of it. So you want to mention that if you see it. You might see it on an MR, as we see here. That's actually bone going up the ligament. And it can affect the ulnar nerve. Any kind of bone in that region, such as ligament problems from uh, chronic stress, will form bone. And you might affect that nerve right behind. Here is the ulnar nerve in the cubital tunnel. And we know that it can have a little bit of high signal on T2 waiting in asymptomatic individuals. We actually did a study recently where we looked at the size of the nerve, and we actually found a threshold of 0.08 centimeters squared for calling it enlarged. And we found that that was more helpful than signal in the region. But uh, you can suggest, if you see high signal or enlargement, that there might be some neuropathy in the ulnar nerve. Here you can see it on sagittal images going along, and this one was symptomatic. It's pretty big and high signal. Let's move on to the other side of the elbow, the ligaments, uh, the posterior lateral rotary instability and dislocation. And when you do tear that luckle that I talked about, you can have what we call posterior lateral rotary instability, which is depicted right here. That's stage one. And you might get some posterior subluxation of the ulna and or the radial head. And the force is usually valgus, axial compression, and supination. With further force, you might actually get a perched elbow, and we'll see that more ligaments are torn in that case on the lateral side, more than the luckle. And uh, if you dislocate your elbow, you frequently tear the medial and the lateral ligaments. So stage one would be a tear of the luckle behind on the lateral side, and you might get a little bit of subluxation of the ulna or the radial, radial head, and think about a luckle tear. Stage two, you'd also be tearing your radial collateral ligament in the front, and that would be a perched elbow. And then you have stage three, which is usually from dislocations, where you've torn more than just the lateral ligaments. Uh, when you dislocate your elbow, you usually do tear the medial side. So the posterior bundle might go first. That's stage 2A. And if you've torn both of those, the posterior and anterior bundles, then it's a stage uh, 3B. So let's look at some of these ligament tears. Here we see the classic location for a tear of your luckle right underneath the lateral epicondyle where it should attach. And uh, you see the fluid and contrast getting around that. And uh, so that is a luckal tear. These patients with stage one posterior lateral rotary instability will have subtle subluxation of their radius and or their ulna. And we notice that this is just not a normal orientation. We want to look at that lateral ulnar collateral ligament if we see it. Now, this person has both a tear of the radial collateral ligament in front and the luckle. So this person has a stage two, and they might actually get a perched elbow. One thing you're going to see if you really have some 
uh, perching or uh, posterior dislocation, which is a common direction for dislocation, is the hill sacs lesion of the humerus, which is the uh, osteochondral injury of the posterior capitellum. It's a very helpful telltale sign to, for you to look at your lateral collateral ligament and the other side ligaments too. We call it the Osborne cotterill lesion because they described it originally. But the one thing you really want to remember also is that this is posterior. Most of our osteochondral injuries of the capitellum are anterior. So it's a different kettle of fish. And it's often associated posteriorly with posterior lateral rotary instability or elbow dislocation. And the luccal and the radial collateral ligament are often torn. And you might see this on a CT, like a little avulsion of the luckle, basically, or it could be a, um, a it could be like an avulsion from having your radial head hit the back, basically like you do in a shoulder with the hill sacs. And you can see it sitting in the classic location. These kind of patients, you might want to do an MR to see that ligament if it's important clinically. Now you're always going to see patients who dislocate their elbow. And many times they don't get any other imaging uh, for these patients. But if you were to get that, it's like a trashed elbow. Notice that on the uh, coronal and sagittal T2 fat sat images that the ligaments and tendons are torn on both sides. There's also a radial head contusion, and you might see fractures of the radial head or the coronary process. You'll usually see capsular disruption, and brachialis muscle frequently gets strained with these dislocations. So MR can be helpful, although sometimes the surgeons say that they don't do anything different if they have an MR. They often just kind of splint these patients. What about the annular ligament, part of the lateral collateral ligament complex that holds your uh, radial head in that uh, ulnar fossa there? Well, it can tear. It's not very common, but when it does, it might look like this. You just can't follow it around, and you see that there's fluid getting out of the joint posteriorly. This is a very rare but interesting uh, development in one of these nursemaid's elbows where the radial head goes underneath the uh, annular ligament and when the mother pulls the elbow. And uh, usually you can do a maneuver to bring it right back. But sometimes it gets between the radial head, the annular ligament, and the ulna, and you can't reduce it. So you can see with ultrasound or MR that it's interposed, and it might actually need some surgery to get it around the head again. And that's what was happening in this kid who they couldn't reduce that radial head back. As you can see on the radiograph, it's out. Now, what about those tendons that attach to the epicondyles? Very common problem in the elbow, mostly degeneration, but you can have inflammation or tearing of the tendons, partial and full thickness. And it's often from overuse or as we get older that we see these things. Uh, it's very common in the non-athletes between the ages of 40 to 60. And if you have lateral epicondylosis, they call it tennis elbow. It is common in tennis players, especially 50% um, of them can develop problems. So they're younger and they're doing a lot of repetitive motion especially this backhand maneuver. Uh, extensor tendons are used in all tennis strokes, but the backhand is the big one. So here's an example of tendinosis. It's pretty florid where you have this thickening of the extensor tendon with a, some high signal in it, and you see it on best on this uh, FATSAT uh, T2. You also see it on the T1. It should be a nice skinny black tendon attaching. And when you have partial tears, you're just going to have a portion of the tendon that is involved, and it can be on the articular surface with the epicondyle. It can be intrasubstance. It can be superficial. And it may be very focal or can be involving the whole attachment. So those are the kinds of things that you want to mention. This is pretty big. Uh, partial tear of the extensor tendon. There is still a little bit of the tendon overlying it, so it's articular sided. And it does, uh, on the axial image, show you that it goes from front to back, so it's pretty extensive, but it's still a partial tear. And you want to see that high signal in those tears acutely. On the medial side, we don't usually see tears as often or tendinosis, but this is an example of a partial tear. You don't see much on T1 except intermediate signal, and on T2 fat sat, you'll see that articular side of partial tear.
Rarely you might get a full thickness avulsion or tear on the medial side like we see here. Um, and you just can't see any tendon on the axial image. They do call medial epicondylosis golfer's elbow, but actually golfers get tennis elbow much more commonly than the medial sided golfer's elbow. Let's now go down to the biceps attachment and the biceps tendon itself and just briefly talk about abnormalities of this tendon. You can have enthesopathy at the radial tuberosity. The tendon can have tendinosis or tears. I won't show you an example, but there is a bursa that's around this tendon that can distend with fluid with repetitive motion. And there's also the post-op evaluation of these tendon tears. And so I'll just show you some of the findings like enthesopathy. You'd never know from this axial MR image without fat suppression that this is not fat. What is that? Right at the radial tuberosity. Well, with the CT, we can see it's an enthesophyte. This means there's been chronic stress on the biceps tendon. What about this biceps tendon? It's not nice and black and skinny. It's thick and in intermediate signal, and that would be considered tendinosis, and it might be painful. Now we go a little further, and we see on a T2 fat sat at two different levels on the radial tuberosity that the tendon is sort of attaching, but it's got pretty high-grade tearing, high signal in it, and that there is reactive change in the radial tuberosity. So that's a partial tear. Now let's follow this tendon, which is retracted up high, and it's actually the more medial short head of the biceps. What about, and we go to fat sat here, the big fat medial short head, it's torn. But what about the long head? Let's follow both down. We can't follow the short head anymore. It's completely torn and retracted, but we can follow the long head. So that's one of the important things about the biceps. You'll have to just discuss like what's torn and what's not torn. And it's a good example of an intact long head. If we see on our sagittal, that long head is going to the radial tuberosity, but the short head is retracted. And we don't want to call that a full thickness biceps tear without describing what we're seeing. And so you might have a full thickness tear like this one where there are no tendons at all, and the whole thing is retracted proximally. Sometimes you get the Popeye sign if you tear the full biceps. And one thing that can be a factor is if you've torn your lacertus fibrosis over the pronator muscle, like this big tear, and you don't see a lacertus fibrosis. That keeps your muscle down, and this person, it's all up there. Finally, the triceps tendon. And if we look here, we see that there's kind of a partial tear within the distal triceps. It's probably involving the um, long and lateral heads, and maybe a little bit of the muscle. And the axial image shows us this right here. So it's almost like a strain of the muscle with tendon involvement, but it's not retracted. We probably wouldn't do too much for that. If we look at this patient, especially on the sagittal image, we see that the tendon itself is torn before it gets to the olecranon. So this is an intratendinous tear, and you always want to mention where you see the tear. Is it at the attachment? Is it in the tendon? And it's only of the long and lateral heads. It's not of the medial head that's still intact. So that's how you'd want to describe this. And they could just sew that back. Whereas this patient, it's a very classic radiographic sign of an avulsion of the triceps. As I mentioned, 80% have bony avulsion. And so then you do an MR, or you could do an ultrasound, both this and the biceps, to see um, what's torn. And if we look carefully in the back, it's those big tendons that are torn. Usually you'll get fluid in the olecranon bursa and hemorrhage back there. And uh, you can see that the retracted tendon is there. The, the bony avulsion might be able to see on an MR, but uh, this is the classic long and lateral tendon tear with an intact medial head. So in summary, what I've tried to do here is mainly go over a little bit of anatomy on radiographs and MR to help you kind of realize what are some of the things that we're trying to see in the elbow. I couldn't cover everything in this uh, short time, but I wanted to express the uh, different pathology
uh, pathologic findings of valgus overload leading to abnormalities of the ulnar collateral ligament, ulnar nerve, and capitellum. The luccal being an important component of the lateral collateral ligament complex that usually tears proximally with varus stress. And that MR can be very useful for evaluating the degree of injury of the epicondylar biceps and triceps tendons around the elbow. Thank you very much.